Marhali, the great red camel, attempted to find his place in Artuis' herd. But he was pushed away because this newcomer showed too much interest in the females. Marhali will live on the outside edge of the troop. He will observe the life of this group without being a part of it. It was the battle season for the serpents of the desert. The males confronted each other violently. The strongest would have the right to choose his female. In the Brumby community, the wild horses of Australia, Utene had been chased off by those he had dominated before his fractured leg. Utene was no longer a stallion, dethroned, alone, and an invalid. All of this, Paraji projected on the Dome of Dreams. For it is in this way we enter life when our dream begins. Of the river that ran in place of the sand, only a little bit of muddy earth remains. The heat is so strong that Paraji the dingo has to dig a basin in the soil, hoping to find a bit of coolness. Near Kira, the other members of the clan find some reasons for exaltation in this mire. It reminds them of old battles disputed in the clear waters of the plain. Suddenly, Kira stops in her tracks. Some rabbits have dug burrows, tunnels, and galleries under the playground of dingoes. There are perhaps over ten, ready to tease the appetites of the pack. Kira starts salivating first. Kira has lost her prey, while Kintala scours over the plain in the hope of detecting some other game. Now it's his turn to try his luck. Here, the rabbits multiply. Their ancestors arrived in Australia with the colonists in 1788. In that era, a dozen among them were released in the wild. One century later, their offspring have invaded the entire continent. Each one is in his place. Paraji, Kira, Kintala, Query. All will have a role to play in the choreography that is preparing itself. Kintala rushes forward first. Immediately supported by Kira. Marty and Query have taken up the relay, rejoined by Kintala as soon as they show signs of running out of breath. Kintala is more durable. Forced to zigzag non-stop, the rabbit can't go any further. It's the end of his dream. That's to say, according to the faith of the real men, the Aborigines, the last fragment of his life. The European rabbit and the brown hare constitute the favorite prey of dingoes. A rabbit of around two pounds satisfies the daily needs of an adult animal without investing too much energy in the hunt.
Therefore, each member of the pack expects the others to be filled before the end of the day. The rabbit that's making Query go in circles is in a subterranean gallery. Too busy sniffing under her feet, Query doesn't yet see the other one who is more accessible and makes herself so discreet in front of her. In order to make Query forget, the rabbit lies flat on the ground and blends in with the soil. He will move only at the last moment. Dingoes hunt in the same manner as hyenas, or African hunting dogs, each taking part in a relay with his teammates until the prey is sufficiently exhausted and accepts the death blow. Each fragment of the rabbit will be bitterly fought over among the members of the group. Normally, all of it should be devoured, with the exception of the fur and some segments of the large intestine. Today, the hunt has been too fruitful. It's with the tip of the fangs that one quibbles about a piece of a tendon or a too flaky bone. Hunger is no longer there, and the enthusiasm has left. Paraji himself doesn't want the back piece due to his discriminating tastes. Waka seizes it gently, as if in order to tease, getting a little jealous reaction from Query. When the piece of meat has served its purpose, Waka will be content to drop it in a casual and provocative manner. From her perspective, Kira, equally full, gives back to the desert what she has stolen from it. But Waka doesn't want only the earth to gain by the leftovers of the treasure. On a neighboring plain, the camels of Artuis herd are exhausted from laziness. They lie down in a drowsy midday state. They are well equipped to live in an arid place. An especially adapted metabolism can transform the 80 pounds of fat in their humps into water. The muscles that form the opening of the nostrils can close up in case of a sandstorm, or simply to avoid dehydration of the mucus. 
Their woolly fur, with sunspots on the forehead or the back, produces a thermal insulation effect, like the layered burnous the Bedouins wear. With the camels, the young are treated harshly non-stop and are subjected to a lot before growing up. They are often the first to fall or to lose their balance when coming undone from a bunch of intermingled bodies. The female gives birth to a baby every two years. The baby is fast, capable of standing up as soon as he comes into the world, and walks some hours later. It will be weaned at one year, but it will stay close to its mother for three more years until it reaches sexual maturity. Harassed by his elders, the little one tries to keep some interest in the world. But even the prickly grass attacks his nose. He then tries to wipe it on the wool of his mother. Happily, the annoyances of life in a group are forgotten as soon as he starts to nurse. The female dromedary, who has two teats, can produce more than two gallons of milk each day, whereas the female camel produces only one. While some of them find their pleasure elsewhere, a young dromedary, tired of being tormented, moves away from the group under the watchful eye of a red-capped robin. Perhaps it's curiosity as much as weariness that now drives the young dromedary farther away. Too far. The walker has gotten lost. No matter where he looks, he doesn't see his mother anymore. The young dromedary hasn't found any other way to forget about where he has drifted other than to fall asleep under the shade of a bush. The desert is too vast for such a weak life. If a pack of dingoes passes by, then the sleeper would become a meal without even realizing it. 
His mother, who has been preoccupied with the absence of her little one, has finally found him. He is so vulnerable, this gift that the gods have not yet taken. Utene's fracture, the Brumby whose own troop rejected him, has been aggravated. He was alone, excluded by his own herd. But a compassionate mare has come to him. Each endeavor to take another step tears at his shoulder and his heart. So Utene hesitates. Wouldn't it be better to stay here motionless and wait? The kicks of suffering are harder to endure than those of some stallions that he provoked into a duel earlier, when the strength of his legs were still intact. Utene is ready to give up, but a friend waits for him and seems ready to show him the way. A burst of energy makes the invalid limp towards someone inviting him to hold on. He accepts spending a few moments of life close to her. The stomach of the mare is heavy. She is carrying Utene's colt. Utene feels his legs weakening. In spite of his distress, he inches towards the mare and lays down close to her. That was his last step.
The moon that provokes in everything that lives a celestial tide of sap and of blood is full like a mare's uterus. Its light makes the brush-tail Fasca-gail emerge from the hollow of a dead tree. Earlier, we compared this little marsupial to a bloodsucker. He is a lover of cockroaches and spiders, and he also loves to cut the throats of fowl who have fallen from a branch. The fat-tailed Dunart uses, although on the ground, the same hunting terrain as that of the Fasca-gail. He is an insectivore who chooses prey rich in water, such as the larva or caterpillars, the ones which fill his hunger as well as his thirst. An observer perks up his ears and frightens away the timid Fasca gale. The spy is a bilby, a fragile marsupial, vulnerable and rare. While the fat-tailed Dunard continues his meal of tender bugs, the bilby rummages in the earth in search of bulbs, seeds, mushrooms, or insects. He is a burrower, capable of digging tunnels into the earth in a spiral manner, six feet in depth. His excrement is made up of 90% sand, swallowed at the same time as his food. Another fat-tailed Dunart joins his friend and chases him into the collective nest. The bilby finds himself alone in this place, flanked by a rat kangaroo who looks crafty. His powerful back limbs permit the bilby to release himself like a spring in case of danger, a danger that is exposed ahead of time by a very keen sense of hearing. A second rat kangaroo now comes to rummage in the blue grass. But the bilby, a secret and solitary ghost, doesn't like to be disturbed. He moves away, leaving the terrain free for some rat kangaroos who materialize from nothing and soon transform into a trio. Offended by being evicted so easily, the bilby comes back. He is an attentive observer and sometimes a frightened one. Bilby spends his day in a nest carpeted with grass and twigs, where his very fertile female gives birth to her babies after one of the shortest gestation periods known for a mammal, 14 days. But it's at night that the Bilby bustles about, scurries and nibbles in the company of the rat kangaroo on the great extensive sand and the undergrowth that the moon turns to mauve. Utene, the injured horse, whose own kind had abandoned him, has been dead for several days. Here on the last continent, we would prefer to say that he has left his dream 
in order to join another dwelling place, a spiritual one. When he is soothed, Utene will dream again and restart his life under a new form. Perhaps he will be a fly, a germ, or a kangaroo. Does it really matter? The dream will decide. Life doesn't exist. There is only consciousness, which can manage without the exterior package. Each dream devours another one. That of the bird feeds off of the larva, that feed off of Utene, that fed off the grass, where the blood of those who died has flowed. Utene, for the needs of his dream, made himself into a form that we call a horse. This form is the one adopted throughout the world by all the spirits that make the same dream. Today, some of these spirits come to gather around this uninhabited thing, which just a few days before still housed Utene. Then the herd gets going again. A dream has been broken. A consciousness has stopped disguising itself. An old costume lays on the ground. It indicates nothing. Some beings dream under the form that we call kangaroo. This is the case with Burka, whose family doesn't stop growing. From Burka's pouch, Toku, her baby, sometimes pushes his way out without hesitation. He goes for a short walk on solid ground. He had to learn to coordinate his movements, to take on going from the darkness into the light, from such a soft cocoon to such a hard planet. Pogo, Cartania's child, has had this physical education for several months now. Soon he will have to get out of the habit of coming back towards the pouch and looking for the teat which has become unnecessary. Yam, Burka's other child, still refuses to give up this habit. Through physical force, his mother makes him grow up. Nagama, the great male that wants to seduce Cartania, watches her. Pogo is trying to force her to play with him one more time. With kangaroos, the male doesn't hesitate to use a child in order to attract the favors of the mother. A female will try to choose the best possible male as a father for her offspring. So without embarrassment, Nagama takes Pogo in his arms. All of these facades are for the benefit of Cartania. My gestures are tender. I'm holding Pogo in order to leave you in peace. Why would you resist me any longer?
Pogo has had enough of being manipulated by his mother's suitors and of seeing himself abandoned by her. Perhaps the Tamar Wallabies will be better company. Without great success, Pogo attempts to go towards them. He must yield to the facts. Nobody wants to play with a little kangaroo searching for friendship. A little Theresian crow attracted by the scent of blood. A dingo who is skin and bones, ready to satisfy himself with any food, and who marks a piece of territory in order to make his temporary hunting grounds. The dingo and the bird are ready to go a little way together. The first drools and salivates at the idea of holding the still quivering fowl in his mouth. But the crow knows that her pursuer will never fly any higher than a stone. The crow and the dingo stand their ground. The predator doesn't keep up any pretensions or illusions. When an animal dies in the bush, the cleaners go into action. There are three teams, bacteria, insects, and vultures. The first decompose the material, return the fluids to the earth, and break down solid matter. The insects lay their eggs that will become larvae, swarming in a soup of lukewarm plasma. The little crow first attacks the eyes. Experience has taught her that you can save time when starting with the soft parts of a carcass instead of working away furiously at cracking it if a dingo has not already done that. Contrary to a vulture, which has neither the majesty nor the equipment, the crow, an indispensable peace worker for the hygiene of the savanna, does not possess a beak powerful enough to cut through the hide. A male western brown snake, beige from end to end. Another male western brown serpent, named Cacalac, with a black head and a reddening body. A female who's passing by, beige with a black head. The combatants are there, and the trophy also. The stage is set for the wrestling to begin. Cacalac leaves his hole and keeps an eye on his rival while the female approaches him. The enemy doesn't appreciate that the trophy can go to another without having been able to show his strength. 
It will, however, be like this, because Cackalack and the female start to brush against each other. Cackalack's rival feels deprived, unseated. The disdain of the female is worse than a defeat in battle. The serpent moves himself away and sinks to a level where he can shelter his pride in a hole. Slowly, Cackalack makes his body slide underneath that of his conquest. His penis will be introduced into the genital cavity and the long spasms will take hold of the two serpents until the female has been impregnated. During this time, the frustrated male makes his way from hole to hole in search of a female who will accept him. She too, who will give herself to him without a preliminary fight. Having found no such fortune, the beige serpent comes to reassure himself that the female has not changed her mind. In a few days, the female will deposit eggs in a nest so that they can be incubated, and the number of which will vary between 2 and 32. Some of these eggs will not be devoured by a little crow, a dingo, or a varanus they will produce one of the most dangerous snakes in the world. Carried by the wind of the desert, a powerful odor of a cadaver, that of Utene, has come to the nostrils of Paraji and his kin. In this heat, a carcass is a godsend. It will save the pack the effort of hunting and will permit it to invest its energy differently. Essentially, the priority is for the metabolism of the body to compensate for its weakening, which is provoked by thirst and the burning sensation of the sun. All other utilization of resources would be to the detriment of this priority. Dingoes are opportunistic predators. This means that they adapt their diet to their circumstances and even their way of life. A prey that one can capture without effort will always be preferable to another, even if that one is more desirable, but for which it would be necessary to fight against. It's also the abundance of prey that varies the surface of the territories and the number of individuals who incorporate to form a pack. A carcass, towards which one will come back after several days' interval, in order to make several meals, offers, therefore, the best rapport between energy invested and that received in exchange. The plains will also find an advantage. Dingoes clean the cadavers. Moreover, according to the same economic principle, the pack kills the weak, the easy to get, and contributes to the natural selection of the survival of the fittest.
For several weeks, Nagama the giant has associated himself with the group that is comprised of Cartania and Pogo, and that had been joined before him by another suitor of the female, named Kudla. With the nose and chest, Nagama pushes away Pogo, who would like to play. From this point on, he's had enough of putting up with the whims of the son in order of hoping to please the mother. Nagama would like to stop the preliminary rituals of love and for Cartania to finally give in to him without any reluctance or ceremony. But the female is not ready to accept in this case and prefers once again to go back to her son, Pogo. Pogo cannot bear being nothing more than a weapon, an accessory, an object that adults use to please their interest. His distress makes him hysterical. Even his grandmother, Burka, doesn't seem ready to offer him any comfort, too absorbed by the problems of her own children. Running in every direction doesn't calm Pogo. On the contrary, the confusion that reigns around him doubles his agitation. Yam, the slow son of Burka, comes to mingle with the group and harass Pogo. Kudla comes to the meeting with Yam. A rejected and pathetic suitor, he is reduced to dominating the weakest kangaroo of the entire group. Cartania escapes from the harassment by slipping through the two rival males. Nagama, however, finishes by going back to her. Pogo, decidedly regarded as an insignificant presence, accompanies Nagama, who has well decided this time to demand his due. Kudla watches Cartania leave with another. This time, he has truly lost the contest. According to the real men, the Aborigines, each death is a celebration for the cosmos. This is because each molecule comes apart from the whole that the consciousness had formed and becomes stardust again. Each drop of blood returns to the stream and each atom to the solar system. It's the same life that continues in the material which is Earth, in the emptiness of space. Utene has become a world unto himself, a universe overpopulated where life swarms and bustles about. A cadaver forms a rich and abounding ecosystem. At each moment, the great mystery of birth and death accomplishes itself. Beings live in the red landscape, dug out cavities and shelters where they bury themselves. Here they reproduce, fight, eat, digest, sleep, and die.
The camels of Artuis clan have stopped for several weeks on the Great Powdery Plain. By bathing in the dust, their leader recovers the sensations already experienced by his ancestors, who came from the Middle East or from India, and was imported in the middle of the 19th century in order to form the caravans of the pioneers. The sand refreshes the skin, relieves the itchiness, and annoys the parasites who are encrusted in the wool. Marhali, to whom asylum has been refused, doesn't have the right to approach them. He cannot take his bath in the proximity of the others. The pleasure is not any less great. The sand is a vast ocean where his race was born. It's his original area, his alone, his true homeland. A fellow camel approaches the banished. He is not allowed to, but the infraction that he commits becomes benign, because each one has gotten used to the presence of Marhali. Marhali has imposed himself, with the passage of time, like an element on the landscape which we don't worry about. He is no longer looked upon, as much as before, as an alien, an invader. Irk is getting up, which signifies that the herd is ready to start out again. Marhali follows in the footsteps of the troop. He has succeeded, for the first time, to reduce the distance that separated him from the others. Perhaps tomorrow he will manage to extinguish that which remains of their distrust. Perhaps he will reach the secret goal which he has set for himself, and which no one, except perhaps the desert sand, has yet to foresee.